Lucky imaging. I'm sure many of you have already heard of the term, but what really is it? When you first mention it, most people would quite rightly think about lunar and planetary photography. It generally involves taking video files, avis or .sur files, thousands of frames and only milliseconds long each one. The reason those planetary and lunar photographers do this is to try and freeze frame the seeing and only keep the absolute best of those exposures. But that's just opened up another question in itself. What is the seeing? Well, let's take a look at Wikipedia's opening line on the matter. In astronomy, seeing refers to the degradation of the image of an astronomical object due to turbulent airflows in the atmosphere of Earth that may become visible as blurring, twinkling or variable distortion. The air blurs things. All right, we've all looked up at the night sky, even without a telescope, and seen the stars appearing to twinkle away. What you're actually seeing there is the seeing. That's what's making those stars, which should be pinpoint sources of light, kind of change shape and wobble and alter in brightness, apparently. Let's jump back over to lucky imaging now. We've just talked about how those planetary and lunar photographers freeze frame the night sky up into tiny little millisecond chunks of time and it's really effective for them but if it's so effective then why don't we do it for deep sky imaging too well as it happens some observatories professional observatories have been doing this already for above a decade fairly recently too in just the kind of last half a decade or so some amateur astrophotographers have been using these techniques of deep sky lucky imaging to take images of their own from their own backyard. But what's changed in this seemingly small frame of time that's all of a sudden made this possible? Well, there's a few reasons, but the real main one has been the advent of the modern CMOS sensor. It's not because of the generally higher sensitivity or indeed the faster frame rates, although in cases they do help, it's more all down to the read noise. Read noise is a small injection of noise that happens every single time an image is read from the sensor. Each and every pixel on the camera gets its own injection of read noise every time it's read. And it doesn't matter how short or how long the exposure is, it's always the same. The only thing that can change it is gain. Now, in conventional long exposure deep sky imaging, read noise is an almost insignificant portion of the total noise in an image. With short exposures, however, on dim objects, all of a sudden the balance shifts and very often the largest portion of noise or signal on a sensor is indeed the read noise from a camera. Now, I understand if this is all getting a little bit heavy, but all that really matters is that we're left with a balancing act. We want, ideally, the shortest possible exposures to lessen the effects of the atmospheric turbulence, but at the same time, we also need a long enough exposure that the signal to noise ratio on that photograph is high enough to ensure that stacking retains a high efficiency. I think we need some examples. I'd like to take you along while we do a little bit of research and jump in to see some results from the masters of amateur deep sky lucky imaging. I'm sure many of you watching this have already heard of Astro Biscuit on YouTube. If you haven't, then just pause this video right now and go check him out. He's got some fantastic content on that channel. Now, recently, he put out a video all about Lucky Imaging, where he tried to challenge the resolution gained by a much larger professional telescope, and all he was using at the time was a 6-inch Newtonian. A very good one, but still just a very small aperture. I won't spoil it for you in case you haven't seen it, but again, go check him out. The result was fantastic. Now, that's just one example of Lucky Imaging working out really rather well. How about we try and find a couple more? For a long time, I've followed a few people in particular, we'll touch upon them in a moment, who've been doing fantastic things with short exposure, lucky imaging on DSOs. One such astronomer is a guy who goes by the handle of XAX. 
If we go check over on his astro bin now, we can take a quick look and you'll see that he's producing things that are just not commonly seen. Now, I could spend all day looking at his works, but take just for example here, this comparison image of M57 versus Hubble. He's used a 224 MC planetary camera, a 12 inch Newtonian, and a two times Barlow. He's taken an incredible 10,000 one second exposures to create this image. Even this though, pales in comparison to some of his newer images using these techniques. Definitely go and have a look around. His work is amazing. Now let's look at another example from a Polish astrophotographer, and I'm really sorry if I get your name wrong, if you ever see this, Łukasz Suica. Now again, there is a bit of a pattern here. There is an incredible gallery. All of his images are excellent. If you take a look at his pictures, you'll notice that a lot of the time he's using exposures that are a little bit longer than you'd usually see in lucky imaging, but still very short by conventional standards. I thought I'd show you this one in particular though, his image of NGC 7331, the Deerlick Galaxy. In this one, for example, he's used 15 second luminance shots, again through a planetary camera, a 178mm, uh, and a 10 inch Newtonian is used this time. Now, even though he's used exposures that are a little bit longer, I don't really think you'd find anyone to argue that his resolution is anything other than top notch though. Now, finally, why don't we take a look at someone using a scientific camera, an EMCCD. Over again on Astrobin, we can find just such a thing being used by a very proficient astrophotographer by the name of Carsten Dosch. You may notice if you check his profile out that you'll see most all of his images are done with very short exposures using an EMCCD. If you take, for example, a look at this M16 image that he shot, he shot this by taking 2,500 five second frames through a 9.25 inch Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain. Now, you might say, well, five seconds isn't all that short compared to what we may have seen from say X-Axe where we're using one second exposures. But the difference here is he shot this using narrow band filters. Let's go back and try and find the spec sheet for this camera. So if we take a look at this spec sheet, then you can see it's got about a thousand by a thousand pixels. Uh, each one is eight by eight microns and it bottoms out around about one electron of read noise. It's also actually from about 2008, but don't let that fool you because this camera is still phenomenal when it comes to read noise. So we know the pixels on this camera are eight microns by eight microns from the spec sheet. So that's 64 square microns of photosensitive area per pixel. If you take that one electron of read noise and divide it by those 64 square microns, you'll see that it has about 0.015 electrons of read noise per square micron. Now, if we do that same very basic calculation for a few more cameras, some of the usual suspects, you'll start to see why it is so special. I've made a little graph, so let's dive in and take a look. So this graph is showing you the read noise per square micron in green bars. I've also added the blue bars right next to them though, which is the read noise per square micron, but with an adjustment for the sensor's peak quantum efficiency. That should give you a better idea perhaps of how it is to use in the real world and how hard it would be to swamp that portion of read noise on any given camera. So what conclusions can we draw from all these images? Well, apart from Rory's six inch newt, the other three all have really quite large apertures, a nine and a quarter inch, a 10 inch and a 12 inch. They all have quite low read noise cameras, in some cases slightly lower than the others. The targets they've chose to image are all, relatively speaking, generally quite bright. And finally, they're all imaging at quite fine sampling ratios. Now, I wanna give this a proper go. Um, I may not have a large aperture scope, but the Esprit 120 that I do have happens to be razor sharp, which may count for something. I do have the right cameras for the job, both mono and one shot color. And I do have a fairly bright, but extremely small target in mind, which I'd like to get a nice image of this year. M57. Luckily, I got outside a few nights ago and the conditions were poor, but I did manage to get a few test captures under my belt. 
Using those test captures, I've been trying many different stacking methods, and I think I'm coming up with a little bit of a plan. So, here's what I'll do. I'm gonna set up and use my 1600mm on the Esprit 120 and take half a night's worth of luminance files. I'm then gonna take off that 1600, put the 462MC in its place, and do the same thing, but capturing color data. Anyway, that's all I've got for you right now, so we'll catch up on the next clear night. Well, the skies have finally cleared after a little bit of time, uh, and I'm out here and I'm actually imaging, and things are underway already. The plan has changed a little bit from what I'd intended, and we'll touch upon that right now. So, like we talked about, I was originally intending to take the monochrome portion of the, tonight's uh, imaging session using the 1600 mm pro doing a long luminance capture to be stacked after the fact and then switching cameras over to the 462 mc pro now this would have enabled a good comparison between one shot color and simple luminance imaging and i would have liked to have done that however another piece of equipment hit the market just the other day and as i was within my return period for the 462 i've decided to go ahead and actually send that back and order the camera's bigger brother that's just came out. Now, I'm really sorry for any disappointment this might cause to some of you guys. Um, I'm gonna leave the rest of the video in as why not tell the whole story as it happened and just be completely transparent with you all. But again, I'm gonna be picking up instead and doing LRGB on the capture tonight. Uh, and I will revisit this target at a later date using the new camera whenever that arrives. So, as I already mentioned a moment ago, things are actually already up and running. But in the meantime, let's just talk a little bit about the target itself, M57. So, many of you probably already know where it's located and indeed what it is. But for anybody who doesn't, this little bit is for you. So, M57 is a planetary nebula. It's an extremely tiny and really quite bright target. And it's located inside the constellation of Lyra. You can find Lyra, if you like, by star hopping from Cygnus, which is quite a recognisable X-shaped formation in the night sky, just up towards Vega, which should become quite apparent where it's located as it's an incredibly bright nearby star. And then there's just a small asterism of stars, kind of almost like a little diamond, right beneath Vega, if that makes sense. Uh, and right in between the bottom two, that's where M57 is. All right, so I've just came over to the laptop and we can talk a little bit about tonight's capture settings and why I've settled on what I've settled on. So first things first, uh, right out the gates, I've got the gain set to 300. The reasoning for that is it, by looking at the graphs, really, uh, that seems to be where the 1600mm's read noise bottoms out and stops getting any lower. So if you'll excuse the pun, there'd be limited gain in going any higher than that. Just to satisfy my own curiosity, I did actually test it out with higher and lower gains before I began capture tonight. Uh, and indeed it did seem like 300 was a very nice balance between signal and noise. It was quite clear every single frame on screen was looking better at gain 300 and the matched exposure, which we'll touch upon in a moment, than the other combinations were. On the note of exposures, I've settled on a three second exposure for luminance. The main reason for that is because at three seconds, with each and every exposure, I could see the parent star, that little white dwarf at the core of M57, just appearing. At two seconds, I couldn't quite make it out, or at least some of the time I could, some of the time I couldn't. Four seconds, five seconds, it was visible in every frame too, but I think by that point, you're getting a little bit away from lucky imaging. Um, it's still perfectly doable, but I wanted to try and see what could be done with as short exposures as possible. Another interesting thing that I've spotted in the frame while just scanning around is that there's a few very tight double stars. The reason that they're gonna be useful to me is because it's gonna help keep an eye on focus. I'll know the moment it's starting to shift and go out of focus because they'll cease to be split anymore. They'll start to become blurred and maybe even merge. At that point, I'll get out the Batinov mask and make any needed adjustments.
All right, so I've just finished luminous capture there. In total, I got about 2,100 frames, which I'm really happy about. That's quite a good bit of data. I slewed away then to Vega before I began my RGB capture. I really need to get that done now before I start to lose the target behind a neighboring roof. Um, just to check how close to parfocal the filters are on this telescope. And as it happens, I don't actually need to refocus for RGB. They're all completely fine. So I'm just gonna go ahead now and shoot off a few sequences. Um, I've upped the exposure to 10 seconds per frame for RGB filters, which I know is maybe slightly out of the realm of lucky imaging, but as I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, I don't think the color capture matters quite so much as the luminance does. So I'm gonna take a few hundred frames through each filter and then hopefully that'll be projects end and I can maybe just slew around and see if there's anything else I'd like to photograph before dawn. Well, image capture on M57 is now finished and I got all the data that I need for this project. Everything I set out to do, I've managed to do tonight and for that I'm really thankful and happy. Um, who really could ask for more from a night of imaging than that? In total, I captured about 2100 three second luminance frames. So that should stack up to be quite a nice detailed stack. I'm hoping anyway. In terms of RGB, I was using 10 second exposures and I think I got about 175 exposures for each of those color filters. Now I have gone ahead and taken some darks and bias frames for both exposure lengths. Uh, I've also recorded those as .sir files. I do believe that Autostacker and both Cyril can utilize those file formats. That's probably the end of the night's photography for me. I'm gonna point the telescope around at a few different targets now and just take a little look at them. Uh, no real intent on doing more photography, just a bit of EAA if anything, that's uh, electronically assisted astronomy. Anyway, that's all from me out here now. I'm gonna catch up with you all a little bit later on back inside. Well, it's a day later and everything is now stacked and edited together. Unfortunately, my original plans for stacking, which involved using Autostacker or Cyril, had to be completely abandoned. The reason being, I was getting weird grid patterns appearing on all of my stacked master images. It's not really something I've experienced before, but I just couldn't seem to get any combination of settings or indeed calibration files to remove them. I'll show you some right now. Now, I tried for hours on end to solve this issue and nothing I was doing was gonna fix it. That's when luckily I found out about a program called PIP. What PIP did is it took those .sir master files, kind of like a video file, and instead turned all those individual images within into just that individual TIFF images for me to use. Luckily, this allowed me to use the old faithful program of Deep Sky Stacker, which without any fuss whatsoever, I don't know what all the trouble was about, created a bunch of usable master files and completely saved the day. With all those master files then created, I was able to put them all into pics insight and get to editing. I maybe went a little bit overboard with the color, but you decide, uh, I'm happy with the image either way. Anyway, we'll get to the final image in just a moment. But first of all, I'd like to say thank you for watching and a huge, very special thank you to all my YouTube channel members. You guys are fantastic. I really hope that you've enjoyed the video. I had a lot of fun making it. If you haven't already, then I'd be hugely grateful if you'd consider leaving a like, comment or subscribe if you aren't already, as it really will help my channel grow and reach as many people as possible. And really, that's all I've got for you right now. Thank you so much for coming along. I do hope you've enjoyed it. And until next time, clear skies.